Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. I took sort of a detour last week to, uh, you know, because I had been challenged in certain things to remind you that it's precept upon precept, line upon line, and that some of this is tedious but necessary to really get the point and make sure you have the right foundation so we come to the same premise of things. And so that's the way I do things. I sort of do a recap and sometimes I have to go over it because there's more information that has to be added to that. And it's too much in one sitting sometimes. So uh, let's just open in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your love, for your grace, which we've been studying. We thank you for moving today in our prayer time, in our Bible study. We thank you that you are a teacher, that you want to go deeper in us, to come higher. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us, because it's all about your faithfulness to bring us into those places with you of communion and worship. And Lord, we just thank you for all the blessings you give us, for our fellowship, for each other. We ask tonight that you come down and really bless our time together. Bless and anoint your word. And we say this in your name, amen. As we've been looking at this, we've been really studying how grace works. We really need to get grace down, and I'm going to get into that even more. But how does grace work? We use it as a, as a word, but it's so much more than that. And Paul is going to try to bring that grace out. We quote what? Ephesians 2, 8 all the time and 9. But there's so much more to being saved by grace. We have to really get that down as to how God wants us to understand grace and what time period we live in. And so what you're seeing is Paul's doing a lot of foundation work here about what grace is. And we take it for granted. We assume a lot about it. Because that's what we hear about, oh, you're saved by grace. Well, what does that really mean? Well, it's unmerited favor. We have our old standbys. I get that. But there's so much more to grace. And it's because of grace we have these heavenly riches available to us. And when we talk about the riches of grace, we know that mercy is attached to it. We know that uh, forgiveness is attached to it. We know salvation is attached to it. All these things are attached to his work of grace. And we don't really think about that we are getting this because of God's grace, not because of anything we have done, not because of our associations or affiliations. It's because of God's great work on our behalf. And of course, we receive that grace that benefit of grace through faith you cannot know grace or receive the benefit of grace other than through faith and so we have to sort of get all of that into our minds we have to realize that we'll be learning about these riches of grace for eternity because it's unending we have no clue how unending God's grace is, and all the riches that are attached to it. There's no limitation on it. We put limitation on it, but there's no limitation to his grace and what he wants to bestow on us because of his grace. Now, the work being done in us is that of sanctification. We all know that. It's the Holy Spirit setting us apart for God's great work. But part of that work is preparing us to receive it by faith. And people talk about grace, but do they really receive that riches, those riches attached to grace? It takes faith. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe it enough to walk in it, to walk it out? Now, as I said this morning, if God tells you something, do it. Because he's given you that time of grace to walk it out and receive the riches that are attached to it but you do it by faith and if you don't trust and believe God then you can 
end up missing the opportunities of really receiving those blessings. Uh, I hope Anna doesn't mind, but she shared with me today, that tonight, that she felt led to pray for somebody to do something, and she didn't do it. And she says, I realize today I missed the blessing of it. See, you can either get part of all that work of grace and his spirit, and receive the blessing of it, or you'll miss it all. And the problem is the church is missing it today because they're not part of that great move of God, that great work of grace that's going on. They're not part of that. They're not stepping out by faith. They're not obeying because of faith. They don't have it in them because they don't really love God in the way they're supposed to. And so they're missing so many different things. Now, we also know we're part of a holy nation, a royal priesthood, and guess what? We're temples. We're temples. We don't think about that. There are two major temples. And it took a while for the Holy Spirit to get that through my mind. There's a temple. Uh, the church is a temple. And the church is built on the foundation of Christ. That's what it tells us. It's built on the foundation of Christ. But you're like a tabernacle in the wilderness. The tabernacle that moved. Because why? The church is founded on the rock. It doesn't move. It is, sits in the midst of all humanity. The church, which is the body of Christ. It sits on the rock. It stands on the rock. It never moves from the rock. And it has the very name of God on it. But you're the living temples of the Holy Spirit. And you're built on the apostles and the prophets who line you up to the cornerstone. Most people forget it's the apostles and the prophets of the new church that establish the word of God, the New Testament. If you ever read the history of it, you will know it was an incredible feat. This is inspired, and those people had to make sure, because they had tons of letters. Some of them were uh, Gnosticism. Had tons of letters that were being thrown at them. This is from God. This is from God. They had to wade through all of that. And today, because they, they prayed, they sat before God, they made sure that what they put in there were from legitimate people like Paul to establish our New Testament today. And because of that, we're founded on them and we are being lined up to the cornerstone. And we have to really get that. Now, do we have those type of prophets today and apostles? No, they're not establishing new revelations. The apostles and prophets today are confirming the old revelation of Christ. They're lining you up. They've got to line you up to that cornerstone. And that's their main responsibility today. And I believe that they're failing in a lot of ways. Whoever, you, you know, these people running around, I'm an apostle. I thought, who in the world appointed you as apostle? Do you know what that means? It means sent out one. And what the apostles did was they established churches. And the prophets came along and they confirmed, or they continued to watch over the church to make sure they lined up to that cornerstone. I don't see that going on today. I see a lot of heresy. I see, oh, we have new revelations. Well, if it's not a revelation of Christ that is founded and lines up to the cornerstone, you're a heretic. We've got to get that tough because there's so many posters, imposters, apostates running around out there that wants to build their own foundation on their own understanding, and it's not on Christ. It's not according to the apostles and prophets. 
You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God is in you. We're told that in 1 Corinthians 6, 17 through 19. You're the tabernacle in the wilderness of the world. And remember, the tabernacle moved as the pillar moved. Please understand, the pillar represent the presence of God moving, which is the Holy Spirit, and the fire of night represented the presence of the Holy Spirit among the people as protection. So the Holy Spirit is in you, and it's by the Holy Spirit you are to walk after. You are to be led by. You are to walk in the Spirit. You are to eventually come to the place you live in the spirit you don't have to debate everything you will know the voice of the spirit you will know whether he's leading you or not and you will know because you know the word of God and you know if it lines up to the word of God so we're like those uh, tabernacle the tabernacle in the wilderness we have to be born again for this presence to be in our life. Do you understand what it means for God's spirit to be in you? For God's presence to be in you? Is it just to stay there stagnant? Is he just there to entertain you, make you feel good? Or is he to lead you into that life with Christ? That intimate life with Christ. Is he to inspire, to challenge you, to always come higher, to give you the gifts, to enable you to carry out your call in your life? That's why the presence of God is in you. He's that breath. Of God in you. That breath that helps you interact with God. That breath that gives you that life and revives you and refreshes you. And oh, the Holy Spirit's in me. Oh, that's nice. I've been born again. Please, we've got to get a hold of this. You know, I, like I said last time, I've been settling for less because I have taken, okay, the Holy Spirit's here and he wants to move. But how far is he moving? How far can he move? You know, that's not my business. I have to trust him to move. And he will move on open hearts. If the hearts aren't open, that's not my problem. I've got to continue forward in what the Holy Spirit's showing me. I've got to have the zeal and the, and the excitement or whatever, the conviction. And I lost some of that because I haven't seen the Holy Spirit move a lot in people. There's so much unbelief. People don't rely on God. They don't trust God. They don't believe him. They don't give him the opportunity to move in and through them. But that's not my problem. My problem is not to let go of what I know is true, hold on to it, and be certain about it, and stand for it. If anybody else doesn't get it, that's not my problem. I can't be subdued about it. I remember one time when I start, first started preaching, we were sending my uh, messages out, and the lady says, boy, you almost sound angry. I thought, really? I am just have this conviction in my life. I want people to get it. I want people to win. I have this conviction you know, I realized that lady shut me down a little bit. I thought, well, you've got to be more uh, subdued for people to listen to you so they don't think you're angry. Well, that was her interpretation. Was that God's interpretation? No. No. Are you excited? Do you have that conviction? Do you believe that with everything in you? Yes, and I can stand on it. And when I stand on the Holy Spirit will enable me to declare what is so. It's not up to me whether people get it or not. Remember, look at verse 18 in chapter 2. It says, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Look at that. 
one spirit we have access. Do we really understand what that means? Do we use that access at all to get to the Father? Whether it's prayer, whether it's faith, whether it's gifts, are we open to walk through that access by the Spirit, through the Father, I mean by the Spirit, to get to the Father? Do we even understand what we have in all of this? Notice it's one spirit. It's not many. It's just the one right Holy Spirit. Unto the Father. We talked about that word. Until we get to the Father, we should never stop. We should never settle for less. And yet we do. How many of us get to the Father? How many of us commune with him, worship him? Because that's who he's seeking those who truly worship him in spirit and truth. So we've been given this access. Access is not a minor word here, people. It has to do with admission. We have a mission into the very throne room of God through the spirit. We've been admitted. We've been given a ticket. You don't have to get a ticket to go into a show. We've been given a ticket to go into the very holy place with God. Are we using that ticket? Or are we get up to the entrance? I remember one time I was watching people when I was challenging them. Because a lot of people are in the outer court. Most of you have heard about the outer court. It's where the sacrifices were done in the tabernacle, later the temple. Then it had, the most, it had the holy place and the most holy place. And God one time told me, uh, showed me that there's people that want to stay as close to the world as they can, so they stay in the outer court. And then he says there's some people that are really sincere about serving him, so they get into the holy place, but they hide in the shadows because they don't want to get rid of what they need to get rid of. But they want to serve God. And then he said, there's some people that actually walk up to the veil, where the veil was. And they get a glimpse into the most holy place, but they won't enter in. Because it becomes uncomfortable to them. And so they back off. And then he said, there's only very few that get all the way in. And I said, God, I want to get in all the way. I don't want to settle for your holy place and hide in shadows because I don't want to get real. I don't want to be as close to the world as I can be. I want to go all of the way. We have the ticket. It's the Holy Spirit. We have the emissions to get in there and we won't go there. And whose fault is that? It's not God's fault. It's our fault. We are admitted into the blessings and promises of God through the Spirit. So let's look at 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. Think about that. You are no longer strangers. As Gentiles, we start out as Aliens to Christ, strangers to the promises of God. But we are no longer. Because of what Christ did, we have the Holy Spirit that has given us that admission, that ticket into everything God has for us. We have to remember, we start out as aliens to Christ, strangers to God in this world and hopeless in our lost status. Christ changed that. Given us the Holy Spirit, gave us the ticket into everything God has for us. You know what the sweetest thing he has for us? Is to commune with him. You see, that's what Adam lost. That's what Christ restored. To enter into communion with him. To walk with him. To talk with him. That's what it's all about. 
How much we need to have that re, re, uh, that revelation. Because of what Jesus did, we are now saints and fellow citizens of the household of God. We're part of his household. Now we had to be admitted because we were uncircumcised Gentiles, had no, no right to the promise, no right to the inheritance. <clears throat> but because of what Christ did, we have rights. We have access through the Spirit. That's why it's so important to know the character of the Holy Spirit. As pointed out in 1 Corinthians 3.11, Jesus is clearly the foundation of the church. We know upon this rock, meaning him, the church has been placed. That's what it says in Matthew. It says the church, not you. The church has been placed on the rock. And that the gates of hell will not prevail against that because they're founded on the rock. Your authority is in Christ. The church's authority is Christ. It can't be moved from that. The church you see today is being moved. That's not the true church. The true church is made up of people. You and I. We're placed in that building. That spiritual house is, is called. And the Lord of that house is Christ. How much we really need to get that. That's Matthew 16, 18. Look at 20 with me. You're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You're the tabernacle. You're built upon the, what the apostles and the prophets have brought forth through inspiration to line us up to the cornerstone. It will not step outside of the word of God. It's that simple. And if these so-called apostles and prophets are not in line with the word of God and pointing you to the cornerstone, the heretic flee them. Don't give them the time of day. Don't listen to them. That's your responsibility. You're the one that has to make sure that your foundation is upon what the apostles and the prophets have taught and that it lines up to the cornerstone. How important is that? It's pointed out the church is the temple of God, but we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We're the tabernacles, the house of the Spirit of God. It was amazing to me that Peter called his body a tabernacle because it could move. Well, we're the tabernacle. And we're being established, what? On true faith. We're being established by our faith towards God. Our faith because of God. Our faith that has been established by the word of God. We have to understand that. Because the apostles and prophets, we do have the New Testament. But the best way to compare ourselves is the tabernacle of the old. Read about that tabernacle. The presence of God. The Shekinah glory within the airy inner court. The presence of God there. The Ark of the Covenant points to Jesus' great work as the way, the truth, and the life. We're like that tabernacle. Now, one of the things I want you to realize is that the tabernacle set in the midst of the barren wilderness of humanity. Not like the temple that's set in the middle of all the religious activities. We are standing in the midst of the barren wilderness of humanity. They're dying. They're going to hell. And the only hope they have is that we stand as a witness, as a testimony. You see, that tabernacle was to serve as a witness and a te testimony to the pagans, even. It's important to understand how this tabernacle was constructed. But you can read about it later in Exodus 26, 7 through 14 if you want to. But it basically had, of course, the, Ac uh, the acacia wood, which represents humanity. 
it was these these planks were placed in silver which points to our redemption we're always standing on the redemption of Christ and then they had four coverings over it four coverings we often don't think of that but you have three levels of skin and you have your muscles and your skeleton four coverings people please get a hold of that okay and so when you look at these coverings, it's incredible what they represent. The, the, the first covering, which everybody saw, was made of badger skins, which was brown. Here is this tabernacle, the presence of God, residing in the midst in something that is ordinary and looks like part of the scenery. Well, tell me, what sets you apart from the rest of humanity? Nothing except Christ. Okay? So that was the first covering. Now we're getting to the second covering. The second covering was made of ram skins that were dyed red. You see, because of Christ's sacrifice over us God sees a whole different picture and then humanity he sees the sun now this is an amazing what the third covering was it was the covering of goat skin and they were all black that represents your sin that represents your sin but between you and the regular humanity is that sacrifice, the ram's covering. Remember what replaced Isaac. What replaced Isaac on the altar in Genesis 22? A ram. What replaced us on the cross? The burnt offering. You see, rams were used as burnt offerings, consecration. Jesus was the burnt offering on the cross. And that red skin covers our sin. And what's the final one? That incredible, beautiful covering that was made of purple, gold, scarlet, The gold color pointed to deity, purpled royalty, your status in the kingdom of God, your royal nation, a royal priesthood. And then finally, ah, what's next with scarlet? Represents man and sacrifice. The man became the sacrifice who was deity for you on that cross you see here's the key no one saw how beautiful that covering was except the priests and only the candlestick and the shekinah glory of god could reveal that to them or it would have been as dark as any other covering what does that tell you people it's not the work outside that matters it's the work inside. And the Holy Spirit is inside you, working that life of Christ in you and causing you to be that royal, have that royal status. So how important is that inner life that you have with God? Because if he's not there, the presence of God's not there, the light's not there, and it's darkness. You have no idea what you have in God if it's darkness in your soul and spirit. I thank God for that incredible light that he put within me. That he looks down and he sees the sacrifice of Christ that blots out from his sight our sins. 
And inside is that wonderful, glorious work of the Holy Spirit. A work that is greater. One of the things you have to understand that the sacrifices were made. Those burnt offerings were wholly consecrated to God. They were made. Why? Because those burnt offerings were consumed by the fire. If you're really letting God have his way, he's going to consume everything old in your life so the new can be brought forth. But you have to give way to the fire of the Holy Spirit. You have to give way to the purging of the Holy Spirit, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, to have that old life purged. Exodus 12.10 reminds us of a very important thing, that when Jesus became our sacrifice, everything about him was consumed because he was that burnt offering. What Exodus 12.10 says, And he shall let nothing of it remain until morning. That which remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Christ became that sacrifice that was utilized and used up completely on our behalf. So we could be forgiven, saved, and sanctified. Jesus is our Passover lamb, and that's what we're remembering this week. Our Passover lamb was completely used up. He was smitten of God. He was afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. We know that's in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Everything about him was utilized and used up for our sake. It was all done by his stripes so we could be spiritually healed we could be reconciled back to God and restored in a relationship with him. You're that tabernacle. You have the presence of God in you. Is that work of sanctification going on in you? Is that beauty being brought out? God's glory being brought out. Actually, be Jesus' glory being brought out in his humanity. Is it being brought out? Is it being established? Are you lining up to the cornerstone? This brings us, of course, to the fact that the priests had that candlestick illuminating their service if it was acceptable or not. Ordained by God. But it still comes down to coming into that place with the Father and truly, truly, fellowshipping with him. Please hear me. No common man can get there. No common man can get there. Only those who are part of the priesthood. Do you understand what it means for you to be part of that priesthood? You can go into those places. You can serve and minister to God and you can go into that place of communion with the Father. That's what it means. Are we taking advantage of it? Are we, oh, well, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. People, we have no clue. We have no clue until we start going forward in our relationship with God. Till we get into the presence of God, we cannot see the beauty of God. And he cannot begin to illuminate the work he wants to do in our lives to bring us to that place where we finally reflect Christ to a dying world. We no longer are just that tabernacle in the midst of the wilderness. Look at verse 21 and 22. In whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord. Remember that. He's taken all the members of his living church, living stones, and he's putting them together, the Holy Spirit is. He's, he's fitting us correctly, tightly together 
So there's no breach in the temple. He's doing that for us. So we can grow up together as a holy temple in the Lord. Think about that for a minute. Are you a holy temple? Because here it all comes down to verse 22. In whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. You're a habitation of God through the Spirit. You're walking around with all the blessings and promises in the Holy Spirit. You're a habitation of the Spirit. A habitation of God. Paul really wanted us to get this. Because we're missing it. We're in our own little cubby holes of, you know, likes and dislikes with people. Our little cliques. That's not what the church was designed for. To find a clique. To find a denomination. To separate you because you don't look right. You don't act right. You don't believe the same way I believe. He's done all this so he can bring forth a habitation, a holy habitation for him to reside in. It's called the church. And every one of you bring the presence of God with you. Because unless you have the spirit, you can't be fit in that, temp in that temple. You can't be fitted there. Because you don't have a place, you don't have a calling, you don't have giftings that can be brought out. And so that's the important part. You have to realize that nothing is done outside of Christ. Nothing's done unless it has been ordained by the Father. Nothing. So why do we try to do everything in our own? Why do we carry everything around with us? Why do we feel responsible for this when God hasn't put the burden there? Why do we let these things hold on to us when God wants to set us free from anything old, anything not acceptable? Why do we keep holding on? Holding on to devils that we don't need, that oppresses us. Holding on to memories. Holding on to all these things that in the end is going to keep us from truly knowing what we have in Christ. We would rather have the bondage of comfortability and convenience and then find out what it means to have liberty in the spirit. Nothing is accomplished, people, unless it's through the Holy Spirit. Nothing. You can do your best, but the Holy Spirit is not there inspiring, showing you, leading you. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's, another, it's not a matter of personal strength and power, but the working and power of the Spirit. Most people don't realize that even God doesn't do anything outside of his Spirit. Not by might or power. You have to think about that. God can do anything, but it's not by might or power he does it, but through his spirit he does it. The Holy Spirit is established in the holy habitation for God. For the church. And he's doing it by preparing us to fit in this habitation, a spiritual house. Now we can look at this, 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's go there. We're going to look at verses 4 through 6. To whom coming as unto a living stone, this allowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. It has nothing about men building this habitation, people. It's God that builds it. It's his temple. He goes on, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 
Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Period. Now there's a lot more after that. But we really need to get a hold of that. It's the Holy Spirit that's building this habitation. Are you allowing him to put you in the church where you belong? Are you giving him permission to give you the giftings that you need to do this? Are you allowing him to tell you what to do with your life so God can work through you because he has the liberty to do so? That's the question you have to answer. We need to realize the establishment of the living church was brought forth by Paul. Paul is laying this out, what the church looks like. How the church is constructed. Now, I'm going to bring this up again. There's a reason I'm going to bring it up. You'll see it. But we need to really understand this. Because what we're seeing today is not the construction of the church. It's a building of a personal kingdom outside of God's purpose. The Holy Spirit's doing this. He's building this habitation, not man. Don't look to man to build it. Yes, man can point you to Christ. Yes, man can teach you. Yes, man can do certain things. But it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the great work in establishing this. We see Peter's reference here to us being a spiritual building. And Hebrews makes reference to the Lord or Master over the household. Jesus Christ is the Master over the household. That's in Hebrews 3. However, Paul is the one that clearly unveils the church. How it looks. How it's constructed. We're going to get into a lot more here. He is going to run this point, hopefully, in the ground so you get it. So you discern, so you understand you're part of this habitation. And you need to be where you're supposed to be so that God can have his way in his church with you. That was Paul's concern. Now, Paul is clearly laying the groundwork of how this body, the church, and our lives would be constructed. He is making it very clear. It is not man doing it. It's not a certain denomination doing it. It's the Holy Spirit. Now, as we're going to see, this is a beautiful picture that Paul is laying out here, but it's been being misconstrued by many. Because the word church is being applied to what? Lifeless works of man. Think about that. When we say church, what do we think of? The building we go to. Right? That's what we think of. But that's not the definition of church. When are we going to get it? Paul is laying it out. The word church today is often a lifeless building and not a viable, living, functioning body. Church means assembly or congregation called out. We're not being called to adjust the world's methods to us. We're being called out of the world. To, this, to stand distinct in the midst of this barren wilderness. Are we doing that? Well, you have to be a temple of the Holy Spirit to do that. You can't, if you stand out there by yourself, you're just like the regular Joe Bull out there. You've got nothing to offer. Absolutely nothing to offer. How many of you know that Israel was considered the church in the wilderness in Acts 7.38? That's what, what Stephen called it, the church in the wilderness. Guess what? God still has a church in the wilderness. It's right in this world. 
And you and I make up that habitation. The real church is being called out of this world, oftentimes in the spiritual wilderness, where consecration can occur. How many of you realize that when Jesus called people, where they had to follow him was out in the wilderness, away from the activities of religion and the world. He would take them out there to places that were so far off they couldn't get food. He had to feed them. But he's the one that fed them. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to feed us? Are we partaking of his word so the Holy Spirit can do something with his word in our lives? I always tell people, give the Holy Spirit something to work with people. He will only work with his word. According to his word, within the boundaries of his word. word. How important is that? We are out in the wilderness right now. Why does he do that to us? So that the life of Christ can be established within us. If you get caught up with all the activities in the world, it's going to, what, choke out what God wants to do with his word in your life. So he takes you out in the wilderness. There's different wilderness people. The world is a wilderness. Let me tell you right now, it is a spiritual wilderness. There's nothing there unless you're there with that witness, that testimony. There's nothing there. But there's also another wilderness. It's called the dark night of the soul. He'll lead you there. He'll lead you into the dark night of your soul. And he's contending with you because there's things in his life he wants to take care of that will keep you from being fit in that church and become part of the habitation of God. The dark night of the soul. You're going to be tested. You're going to be tried. Do you really believe God? Do you really want him to do the deep work in you to bring you higher? It's going to cost you something. Usually it's going to cost you the world. It's going to cost you personal family things. It's going to cost this. It's going to cost that. But let me tell you something. The way into heaven is narrow. You can't take anybody else there with you. This is your journey. This is your journey, your life. And you've got to find out what God wants from you. Is it going to hurt you? Yes. Are you going to say, but I don't want to leave them behind? You've got to leave them behind. Because maybe you're staying in the way of what God wants to do with them in the first place. You follow him. I like what Peter happened to Peter. He says, you know, when Jesus said, feed my sheep and my, uh, my lambs, my sheep, my fold. And so Peter's looking at this guy and he says, what about him? I love what, Peter's, what God, Jesus said. It's none of your business. You just follow me. Those souls are God's business. Unless you are to speak in them, it's his business. You follow him. Because he's going to get you where you need to be. And if you get out of the way, maybe he'll get your family or your friends where they need to be. But you'll never get them there. You'll never get them there. You'll be in their way. You'll stand in their way. I remember when God finally called me. He said, leave. Leave what you're familiar with. Leave behind your old life. Leave and follow me. And when I was ready, he brought me back to deal with some issues with my family. But people, Jesus was totally utilized for your sake on that cross. What are you willing to let go of so you can follow him and truly become a habitation of God.